Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds today. Today we will be presenting the Robert S. Mendelson Lecture. We're honored to have his son here today in the audience, carrying on the legacy, as he says. Uh, this le lecture was established by Dr. Mendelson and his family to promote outstanding physician scientists with a commitment to education, compassionate clinical care, and bedside teaching. Dr. Mendelssohn graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Washington and Lee University, after which he attended Washington University School of Medicine. He then interned at Barnes Hospital, spent two years at the NIH in hematology research, and then returned to St. Louis for a career in clinical academic medicine and private practice at Washington University School of Medicine, Jewish Hospital, and Barnes Hospital. Dr. Mendelssohn was known to many for his extraordinary clinical care. He attended and actively participated in the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds for more than 70 years, which we were ref reflecting on uh, this morning with his son. We honor him today with this lectureship. Now I, I invite Dr. Humphreys to introduce our speaker. Okay, well, good morning. And again, it's wonderful to have you here, Dr. Mendelson, for the Mendelson lectureship. And it's really a pleasure and privilege for me to introduce Dr. Nisha Bansal, our uh, visiting professor and speaker this morning. She is a professor and the holder of the Arthur Statch Family Endowed Professorship in the Division of Nephrology at the University of Washington. She is also an investigator in the Kidney Research Institute, the Director of Nephrology Clinical Research Education, and the Director of the Kidney Heart Service at UW, and we'll be hearing more about that today. It's a very exciting uh, innovative service. Uh, Dr. Bunsall completed college at Brown, her medical de degree at UConn, internship and residency at Tufts, followed by completion of nephrology fellowship at UCSF. Her continuously funded NIH research program consists of clinical patient-oriented studies to understand the pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment of cardiovascular disease in patients with kidney disease. Her work has led to national recognition, including induction into the American Society for Clinical Investigation and receipt of the ASN Distinguished Research Award. She has served as a counselor uh, for women in nephrology alongside our own Dr. Anuja Java. She's the chair of the Gender Equity Council in the Department of Medicine at UW. And we are so pleased to have you here today, Nisha. The title of her talk is Kidney Conundrums in Patients with Heart Failure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's truly, truly an honor to be here to honor Dr. Mendelssohn. And I'm especially delighted that his son, Dr. Mendelssohn, is also here as a cardiologist. So um, thank you again for the invitation. So today, the title of my talk is Kidney Conundrums in Patients with um, Heart Failure. These are my disclosures. And so I'd like to start with a patient case that's probably very common to most people in the, this audience that highlights several of these kidney conundrums that we encounter in patients with heart failure. So we have a 64-year-old gentleman with chronic kidney disease. The cause of his CKD is polycystic kidney disease. His um, estimated GFR is 37. He has minimal proteinuria, and he presents with new dyspnea on exertion and lower extremity edema. So the first question or conundrum I'm going to pose to you is, what is the likelihood that this patient has heart failure, or is his presentation simply related to his chronic kidney disease? He then gets admitted for evaluation of his dyspnea on exertion and possible heart failure. They measure an NT pro BNP, comes back elevated. Does this measurement of his NT pro BNP actually help you in the diagnosis of his heart failure? Finally, he's admitted he begins diuresis with furosemide. Um, his weight decreases by one kilogram. However, his creatinine bumps um, from 2.2 to 2.6. The last conundrum that we're going to discuss today is, well, should we stop his diuretics given his acute kidney injury? So um, hopefully over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll be able to answer these clinical conundrums that we see frequently in patients with heart failure. So today we'll discuss the epidemiology of heart failure in patients with kidney disease, 
uh, talk about how to interpret cardiac biomarkers in this population, um, acute kidney injury and diuretic management in these patients who are hospitalized with heart failure, and finally, I'll spend a little time telling you about this new service we launched about three years ago. It's called the Kidney Heart Service, which is a specialized cardionephrology service. So to start off with, so unfortunately for patients who have chronic kidney disease, they're at high risk for poor outcomes. We know that they're at high risk for losing their progressive loss of kidney function, leading to end-stage kidney disease, requiring dialysis or a kidney transplant. But in fact, um, their competing risk of death from cardiovascular causes outweighs this risk of progression to end-stage kidney disease, which prompted my interest in studying this further. And if you think about the types of cardiovascular disease that patients with kidney disease are suffering from, heart failure is one of the most common types of cardiovascular disease seen in this patient population. We actually looked at this in collaboration with Dr. Ian DeBoer, a nephrologist also at University of Washington, in which we studied 18,000 community-based um, participants, and we compared those with versus without CKD. Those with CKD are those with the light gray bars. Those without CKD are the dark gray bars. And what we did is we looked at the rates of heart failure, coronary heart disease, and stroke. Um, and you can see that the height of the light gray bars are significantly higher than the dark gray, suggesting that patients with kidney disease have higher rates of all these types of cardiovascular endpoints. However, particularly the difference between the two bars is greatest for heart failure and coronary heart disease, suggesting that the excess risk of cardiovascular disease in CKD patients is largely explained by heart failure and coronary heart disease. And I think this is an important, this was an important piece of data that we had from 2017 because the conversation up until then was really focused on coronary heart disease and less so on heart failure risk reduction in patients with CKD. And in fact, national data from the U United States renal data system also has looked at the cumulative incidence of heart failure in over three years in patients who have chronic kidney disease, denoted by the, the blue line, um, as well as hemo those treated with hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And you can see from this figure that the cumulative incidence of heart failure over three years is as high as 60% in patients um, with kidney disease. So clearly this is a huge problem. And so why are we seeing so much heart failure in patients with kidney disease? I would say it's complicated. Uh, you know, there's a very complex bi-directional relationship linking these two disease states. And, you know, simplistically thinking, I think about three buckets of mechanisms. Um, the first is certainly hemodynamic. And so what we see is that, um, especially in response to neurohormonal dysregulation, we see uh, fluid overload and retention of salt and water, which leads to both cardiac congestion but also kidney congestion, um, and then also limited um, organ perfusion from vasoconstriction. Second, we see that there's um, activation of neurohormonal pathways, including the renin um, aldosterone angiotensin system, as well as activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And then finally, there's a mixed bag of mechanisms which remain incompletely elucidated, but include um, inflammatory markers, um, malnutrition, importantly in our patients, disorders of bone mineral metabolism, phosphorus, vitamin D, and PTH, acid base, and certainly anemia. And so why do we care so much about heart failure? We know that patients who have CKD and heart failure don't do well, unfortunately. They have poor clinical outcomes. And this is a study that we published several years ago in collaboration with Dr. Alan Goh over at Kaiser, and one of the PIs of the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Cohort Study, in which we studied 4,000 patients who had CKD, and we first started looking at rates of heart failure hospitalizations. And it was um, astounding to us that there were patients in the study that had up to 17 heart failure hospitalizations within a single year. Um, so spending more time in the hospital in some ways than at home. And when we looked at the rate of heart failure hospitalizations, we found that it was about tenfold higher in patients with CKD compared to those without CKD. And even if they were um, left the hospital, about a quarter of them did come back within 30 days for recurrent heart failure. And when we looked across levels of kidney function, we found very strong relationships between lower EGFR and higher urine ACR with these rates of heart failure hospitalizations. 
We then looked at whether um, the number of times a patient is hospitalized actually portends a poor prognosis in terms of risk of loss of kidney function as well as death. And what we saw was that in patients who had one or more heart failure hospitalizations, that they had um, almost two-fold higher risk of decline of EGFR by 50% or development of kidney failure. When we looked at mortality, again, we saw that those patients who had one or more heart failure hospitalizations per year had two to three-fold higher risk of dying. So knowing how, how poor some of these patients do, it's really important to think about how we diagnose heart failure in persons who have chronic kidney disease. And so heart failure does remain largely a clinical diagnosis. You start with symptoms and think about symptoms or signs that are suggestive of heart failure before um, pursuing um, additional testing. And I'll just say that this is pretty tricky to do in a patient who has chronic kidney disease. So these are, um, you know, heart failure in the middle, and these are three types of symptom categories that you see frequently in patients with heart failure, dyspnea, fatigue, and edema and, and volume overload. And I can tell you as a nephrologist that it feels like every single one of my CKD patients has these symptoms, and it's true that there is a lot of overlap in terms of symptomology between these two disease states, which makes it hard to distinguish between what's really going on. However, I would urge you not to ignore symptoms um, that could be suggestive of heart failure, as they're often missed, and studies have shown that, in fact, that they do have prognostic significance in terms of future development of heart failure. And so this is a study I really like in which they, uh, they use the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Score, which is a validated survey instrument which assesses early heart failure symptoms and quality of life. And what they saw was that um, if they looked at a CKD population who had no known heart failure, they found that as many as 40% of patients who had CKD had symptoms that were suggestive of early heart failure. And when they looked longitudinally, they found that those with the greatest burden of symptoms had threefold higher risk of developing new heart failure within one year of symptom assessment. And so to summarize what we've discussed so far, I've shown you data that heart failure develops in 40 to 60% of patients with kidney disease. Um, and due to various mechanisms, including hemodynamic, neurohormonal, and others, development of heart failure is associated with poor clinical outcomes in our patients, including loss of kidney function and death. And it is a clinical diagnosis, but a, the, which remains challenging in CKD patients due to overlapping symptoms. And so coming back to our patient, the first question or conundrum I posed to you is, well, what is the likelihood that this patient has heart failure, or should we assume his symptoms are from CKD? I would say that there's, given the lifetime incidence of heart failure, there's a very high likelihood, and I would say he certainly deserves further workup. So again, he gets admitted to our hospital um, for evaluation, and his NT pro BNP comes back as elevated. So how do we interpret cardiac biomarkers in patients with kidney disease? So as um, some of you may know, um, natriuretic peptides, which include brain natriuretic peptide and N-terminal pro-brain natriuretic peptide, um, are frequently measured in the hospitalized setting. And uh, basically what happens is in the setting of myocardial stretch, there's activation of the brain natriuretic peptide gene, which leads to the expression of the protein, and it, which is eventually cleaved into two forms, the biologically inactive NT pro BNP and the, bi and the active metabolite and brain natriuretic peptide. And the downstream effects of this protein is that it counteracts the, the RAS system and leads eventually to naturesis and diuresis. And natriuretic peptides are used almost universally in the management of both acute and chronic heart failure. And this is just a snapshot of um, several guideline um, groups which really endorse use of natriuretic peptides for the diagnosis and management of heart failure. So what about in CKD patients? And so this is um, unpublished work by one of my fellows, Dr. Zemke, in which we took a new heart failure staging criteria that was published recently, um, which now includes measurement of, of natriuretic peptides to stage patients with heart failure. 
And so we asked the question, well, how does this affect our CKD patients? And what we found is that using these new heart failure criteria, that up now 63% of patients who have chronic kidney disease are considered to have heart failure. And so, you know, is this appropriate? I would say that, you know, the use of natriuretic peptides in patients with chronic kidney disease remains controversial. And why is that? Um, you know, there's this effect of kidney function on circulating natriuretic peptide levels. We know that there's this inverse relationship with lower EGFR and higher levels of brain natriuretic peptide. And the question always arises, were well, our elevations in these biomarkers simply due to impaired kidney function or do they reflect to true cardiac pathology? And so this is a study that I really love that was done quite a while ago now, but they took 165 patients who were undergoing renal arteriography and who actually measured renal vein and renal artery concentrations of BNP and NT pro-BNP to look at the fractional excretion of these, of these circulating markers. And so here we have two figures. The top one is looking at NT pro B, uh, BNP, and the bottom one is looking at NT pro BNP. And the first thing that, and, and along the x axis here, you have GFR, and along the y axis, you have the fractional excretion of the, of the biomarker. And what you see here first is that these two cur curves, if you compare them, look fairly similar, suggest suggesting similar fractional excretions of both BNP and NT pro BNP. And then when you look at the fractional excretions, you can see that they range anywhere from 0.2 to about 0.3, which is fairly modest. And so I would say that elevations in NT pro BNP and BNP are explained in part by reduced kidney clearance, but not entirely. And our group has also shown that these the elevations in these biomarkers are in fact prognost prognostic in patients with chronic kidney disease. This is work that's led by Dr. Leela Zelnick, who's a biostatistician at the University of Washington who works with me. And we looked at, the, we looked at a stable ambulatory cohort of CKD patients, and we looked at you know, whether measured NT pro BNP actually predicted outcomes. And what we saw was that the high, those patients with the highest levels of NT pro BNP were more, much more likely to experience heart failure. And then we actually compared the prognostic value of a single biomarker measurement to an echocardiogram and found that they had similar performance. So what about in the acute setting? In the acute setting, um, you know, it does remain tough because patient comes in with dyspnea exertion. Um, NT pro BNP is used to rule in or rule out heart failure as well. And so this is a study in which they looked at 600 patients who are presenting to the emergency department with dyspnea, and they compared those with versus without CKD, and the sensitivity and specificity of measuring an NT pro BNP level to rule in or rule out heart failure. And what they found was that one of the top line represents the patients without CKD, the bottom line those with CKD, and the closer you are to the top, this is our um, ROC curve, the better the performance of the biomarker. And what we see here is actually that they, these two curves look fairly similar. So the performance of using this biomarker in the acute setting was um, pretty comparable in patients with CKD versus without. However, what they did note was that the levels that were used to rule in or rule out disease differed between those with CKD versus without, with that, those with CKD requiring a level of almost 1,200 versus 450. And so this brings into question, so if we know that um, these biomarkers can be used to rule in or rule out disease, can we apply the same thresholds we're using in the general population in patients with CKD? And so we, try, we looked at this, in fact, and we took a threshold of an NT pro BNP of 125, which is what's used clinically to rule in or rule out heart failure, and we applied it to a stable asymptomatic ambulatory CKD population, and we found that just applying this threshold to these patients who are unlikely to have acute heart failure, 40% of them would have ruled in for heart acute heart failure. So from that work, we, you know, it's probably unlikely that we can apply the same thresholds we're using in non-CKD patients to those with CKD. And so we went um, and decided we're going to try to develop our own thresholds for these biomarkers that we can use clinically. 
And so we did this using a very uh, tr tried and true laboratory medicine method where we look at normal distributions of the biomarkers in healthy individuals. And so what we found was that um, a value of about 1,000 um, seemed to be, um, it was the 95th percent of distribution um, for, uh, for the levels of NT pro BNP in a healthy CKD ambulatory population. We also validated this externally and found that this threshold worked pretty well, um, you know, in terms of ruling in and ruling out disease. But prospective validation is still were needed to bring this to market, I would say, to bring this into the clinical setting, which is ongoing. So what do we do until then? Um, so until then, you know, I think we can offer an alternative. So this is work that we just published, and this was done in collaboration with Joe Ix, who's at UCSD, in which we asked the question, well, since we don't have a threshold yet that we can use clinically, can we, can we develop into baseline uh, thresholds for each patient who has a chronic kidney disease? And so to do this work, we looked at the biological variability of NT pro BNP across levels of EGFR. And what we found was that the biological variability was fairly similar. And so suggesting that an individual, for each person with a CKD, they can establish their own baseline that can be used then subsequently to rule in or rule out disease. And to summarize, I've shown you data that um, we think that elevations in these biomarkers likely reflects in part cardiac pathology and not all due to reductions in kidney clearance. Um, I always tell my house staff, please don't ignore them. If you're going to measure it, think about what the value is. Um, elevations in these biomarkers are associated with higher risk of heart failure. However, it is unlikely that we can use traditional cutoffs in patients with CKD, and we need some further work to actually um, move this into the clinical setting. But in the interim, I think that we can establish baseline levels of bi these biomarkers during asymptomatic ambulatory states that can help guide our management um, for future events in patients with CKD. So thinking back to our patient, um, you know, his, I, we measured an NT pro BNP level, which came back as elevated. I, you know, I asked the question, well, does this actually help you, or is it all related to his kidney function? I would say yes. Um, I think that it's highly likely that he has heart failure based on this value. So finally, the patient is admitted. He begins diuresis with Lasix, and his weight de um, decreases, but his creatinine increases. Should we stop his diuretics? And so we'll discuss on how to handle this situation in patients who are hospitalized with heart failure. And I would say this is a really important topic um, and causes a lot of stress in the hospital. And this is a real news story. I have not made this up. This happened in Michigan where there was a fight between a cardiologist and nephrologist about diuretic management in the setting of AKI that led to the arrest of one of the physicians. I'm not gonna tell you which one, <laughs> but a physical alteration, um, all about diuretic management. So, you know, people in Seattle are nice, so we haven't had any fist fights in the halls yet, but I think it's, it's a discussion that, uh, that there's a lot of interest in this area. In fact, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Glockenflecken, who does all this medical satire pieces, but so much that he's developed a whole series on cardiology versus nephrology, really focused on disagreements about volume management, um, and this is him on um, holding lots of salt. <laughs> And so why is this important? So we know that um, the prevalence of acute kidney injury is really high in patients with heart failure and affects our acute management. These are data that's um, taken from 11 studies of almost 80,000 patients. And what they saw that in patients who are hospitalized, AKI affects about 70% of those patients. And why is this important? We know that AKI in the acute heart failure setting um, is associated with poor in-hospital as well as post-hospital outcomes, including um, higher rates of diuretic resistance, longer length of stay, higher rates of readmission, higher rates of CKD and progression to end-stage kidney disease, and higher rates of death. And in the acute, in the immediate setting, it also affects how we treat patients. We know that goal-directed medical care, uh, uh, Therapy includes RAS inhibitors, MRAs, and diuretics, which are all considered standard of care. 
Um, and kidney function is so important in terms of considering these therapies. It affects how they, these therapies work, as well as their safety, and it affects decisions uh, around initiation, dosing, as well as discontinuation. And so, you know, the question that, we, the biomarker that we use most frequently um, to measure kidney function in the hospital is serum creatinine. However, I question, well, does serum creatinine adequately capture changes in kidney function, especially related to congestion or decongestion in these patients with heart failure? I think there's a lot of limitations of using serum creatinine to measure AKI in patients with heart failure in particular. One is that we know that creatinine is one measure, it's a measure of filtration, um, and, and does not necessarily um, reflect the complex physiology that's happening in these heart failure patients. Creatinine is meant to measure, be measured in steady state, um, which these patients certainly are not. Um, it tends to lag in, in the setting of acute kidney injury and um, rises late and lags with progression or, of injury or repair. And it, um, production of creatinine can be biased, especially in patients who are malnourished, um, of which a lot of heart failure patients are. And in fact, studies have looked at l serial changes of creatinine in the hospital setting to see how they associate with outcomes. And this is a study, which was a post hoc analysis of a trial, which they found that both improvements of creatinine as well as worsening of creatinine were both associated with higher rates of in-hospital um, in mortality, which, um, which makes it difficult to understand whether we should be using creatinine at all if, it, if the changes in creatinine don't matter. And so, in fact, the current American Heart Association guidelines do not recommend serial measurement of serum creatinine in patients who are admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, as a nephrologist, I'm a little troubled by this because I don't think the answer is to ignore kidney function. I've shown you how important it is, but I think we need better alternatives to reflect what's going on in these patients. And so in nephrology, you know, for the last about 15 years or so, there's been a large and a lot of interest in using kidney injury biomarkers as an alternative to creatinine in the setting of acute kidney injury. And this is a, a figure that shows you um, the natural history of, of injury, where you start with the normal um, kidney epithelium in the, in the renal tubular cells, and you can see the whole spectrum of disease, which eventually leads to apoptosis and cell death. And that's really where we're picking up our serum creatinine measures is when you've re reached this advanced stage of injury. And so as a field, we've been really interested in capturing injury earlier in the spectrum of disease so we can intervene. And so that includes measurement of biomarkers that can be measured in the urine. And so how can we apply these kidney injury biomarkers in the setting of these heart failure patients, particularly with congestion and decongestion? And so this is a study that I really love. It's only 30 patients, but I thought it was very clever. They asked the question, you know, in hypervolemic patients, does decongestion actually improve kidney function? And so they took 30 patients who had chronic heart failure, who are euvolemic, and what they did is they withdrew their diuretics, and, and they made them hypervolemic. And then they reinitiated diuretics, and then they got them back to euvolemia. And during this, these, tr these time points, they were measuring um, a variety of kidney markers, including serum creatinine as well as urine injury markers, to test the hypothesis whether kidney function changes with congestion or decongestion. And so this is their data in which this, this top line is serum creatinine. And so you can see here that they, this is the patients at euvolemia, they made them hypervolemic reinitiated diuretics, and then made them, uh, got them back to euvolemia. What you see is that the creatinine is a straight line. So it doesn't change at all with changes in volume status. In contrast, when they looked at two of these urine markers, they looked at KIM-1 and NAG, and what they found was that in the setting of hypervolemia, that these biomarkers increased, and then in the setting of when euvolemia was restored, these urine biomarkers decreased. So, so these urine injury biomarkers may better reflect acute changes in volume status that are affecting the kidney. And so we did a study to follow up on this um, in which we took 62 patients who were admitted with heart failure, and we measured a broad range of um, urine and blood injury markers and serum creatinine at hospital admission when they were hypervolemic and then when they achieved euvolemia. 
And what we did is we, 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 did a, we measured about 14 different markers that, were, um, re that represented injury in pathways across different parts of the nephron. And this work was led by Dr. Alex Kula, a pediatric nephrology fellow who's now at Northwestern, who was working with me at the time. Um, and so what we found was that we first looked at patients who were successfully diuresed, who achieved euvolemia, and these bars represent changes. And so the greater change, the more responsive these biomarkers are. And so you can see that BUN and creatinine, even in the patients who are hypervolemic and achieve euvolemia, did not change much. Um, but then some of these urine injury markers actually were much more dynamic and responsive to these changes in volume status. Similarly, we looked at those patients who did not get better, that they remained hypervolemic and their volume status worsened. So in that situation, you would expect that the, urine, that the kidney markers would also worsen, reflecting worsened volume status. Again, BUN and creatinine don't change, but these other markers do. And so from this pilot study, we thought that you know, this was very interesting that the urine kidney injury markers were more dynamic and potentially better reflected changes in volume status, especially compared with serum creatinine. And so we're actually doing a follow-up study right now um, in which it's called the KIND HF um, study, the Kidney Injury and Decompensated Heart Failure Study. And the goal of this study is to follow up on the pilot study it's to identify kidney injury markers that can guide diuretic and heart failure management in the short term and better predict long-term kidney and cardiovascular outcomes. And um, to do this study, we've re we're recruiting 400 patients um, who are hospitalized with heart failure at UW. Um, and we actually just recruited our 400th patient, so I'm very excited. Um, and we are uh, measuring serial measures of lots of different kidney markers um, during their hospitalization and once they leave the hospital. And we're also doing a lot of in-depth analysis and data collection on systemic markers of, volume, of congestion. So we're doing um, research level echocardiograms, right heart catheterizations, point of care ultrasounds, including lung ultrasound and venous excess ultrasounds, weights, INOs, and validated symptom scores. And we're looking at changes in all these measures, particularly as they relate to kidney function um, and as well as systemic congestion. We also follow these patients long term. We follow them to up to a year and look, and we're also measuring their kidney function as well as changes in their volume status and their heart failure status. So what, what we've discussed so far in terms of AKI and diuretic management in patients with heart failure, we've seen that AKI fr occurs frequently in heart failure patients. Kidney function is critical in the short term um, treatment as well as prognosis of heart failure. I believe that serum creatinine is not our best biomarker to guide heart failure treatment, particularly to reflect acute changes in volume status, congestion and decongestion. Um, I think that there is some promise in thinking about alternative measures of kidney function that can be used in this setting, particularly those that are measured in the urine, um, but more data is coming. So for this patient who was admitted, he was diuresed, had sort of a, I would say, a suboptimal diuretic response, but his weight did decrease some. Um, his creatinine increased. I absolutely would not stop his diuretics. I think he's still volume overloaded. I don't think I believe the creatinine, and we should keep going. So finally, um, you know, if this patient was in Seattle, he would probably be co-managed by the service that we've launched about three years ago. It's called the Kidney Heart Service. And so I'll just take a few minutes to tell you a little about um, what we've been doing in Seattle in this space. So why did we do this? So why cardionephrology care models? So I think we can agree that the interface between cardiology and nephrology continues to expand. This is a very large and growing population of patients affected with both diseases. And really, um, we're at a time where there's a lot of therapies as well as diagnostics that are, are bringing these two specialties together. SGLT2 inhibitors are just one example. Um, and we felt that there was a need for unique expertise that may not be addressed by training in individual specialties alone. And so we started looking at our data in Seattle to see you know, how are patients with, um, with heart failure in particular doing. And so when we looked at our own um, UW data, we found that in, we had about 1,000 heart failure hospitalizations, unique heart failure patients a year. 
And of those, 65% of them were, had um, concomitant AKI, so a lot of patients. And then when we looked at those specifically who were receiving mechanical circu circulatory support, 40% um, of them required acute dialysis. Um, and then we looked at the average length of stay, the death rate, and the readmit rate. And what we saw was that in patients who, with heart failure with AKI, their length of stay was 17 versus 6. In those without AKI, their death rate was significantly higher, and they were more likely to be readmitted within 30 days. And so given how, how acute these patients were and the overlap between kidney and heart disease that we were seeing, we decided to launch this new service, which was called the Kidney Heart Service, KHS, which we launched bravely in August 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so it was, it's, initially we staffed it with three nephrology attendings, um, Dr. Nayan Aurora, myself, and David um, Mariuma. And this was really spearheaded in the vision of my division chief at the time, Dr. Stuart Shankland. And so the mission of this new service was threefold. Clinically, we were hoping to provide exceptional, coordinated, multidisciplinary care, as well as develop new innovations that would improve their clinical outcomes. Two, to provide educational opportunities for trainees um, to learn about the specialized care of kidney and heart disease. And three, from a research perspective, to build a foundation for scholarship, including quality improvement and research. And so what did we do? So first, in terms of clinical innovations, um, the nephrology attendings, we all developed an expertise in hemodynamics, and particularly in cardiovascular devices, and um, including mechanical cir circulatory sport, support. We also all trained in point-of-care ultrasound to help with our volume assessment. And I think one of the most exciting things that we've done, which is truly collaborative, is that we developed this diuretic protocol to really think about how we're diuresing patients, particularly when, in those who are diuretic resistant. And so what does our diuretic protocol do? It provides guidance on starting doses and how to titrate diuretics, applies objective measures to assess response, and then it also provides direction on when and how to utilize adjunctive therapies with the goal of achieving sequential nephron blockade. So just take a moment to walk you through the diuretic protocol on a high level, just so you can see what it looks like. And so the step, first step is we think about, well, how, what is the how should a patient um, be diuresed? What is the initial dose? And so we start by, um, we take their outpatient dose of diuretics and we, we increase it by 2.5 times and we give guidance on both IV bolus um, as well as infusion dosing of a loop diuretic. We then, step two, is we really focus on how to assess response. So, you know, of course we're looking at weights and I's and O's, but one thing that we've done is really move to spot urine sodium assessments one to two hours after diuretic administration. So why are we doing this? So, you know, it's challenging. I think we've all seen that weights are tough to get in the hospital for some reason. I don't understand why, but they're never accurate or they're just not done. And actually, even in a clinical trial setting, people have looked at the accuracy of weights, the correlation between diuretic-induced fluid loss and weight loss, and it's only a correlation of 0.55. So even in a trial setting, it's pretty poor. And so, um, and same with urine output. For some reason, we can never figure out how much a patient is actually peeing with good accuracy. And so there's been studies that have shown very good performance of looking at spot urine sodiums as a marker of naturesis in the first one to two hours that correlates really well with um, overall diuretic response. And I think from a practical standpoint, what it does, it allows you to make a decision on response within a few hours versus waiting 24 hours to look at net eyes and O's and weight changes. You're giving a diuretic, you're checking them in two hours and seeing if, if you need to up titrate. And in fact, there was a trial that was published in Nature Medicine last year which looked at this, and they looked at a, a urine sodium um, guided diuretic regimen versus standard of care. And while they found no difference in mortality or hospitalizations, they did find that patients achieve greater naturesis. So the third step of our diuretic protocol is where we think about other diuretics beyond loop diuretics. And we've given sort of a stepwise approach to thinking about this based on the metabolic profile of the patient as well. So we our first line is always thiazides if possible. And then we start thinking about different, different um, diuretics that can affect other parts of the nephron. 
including amelioride, spironolactone, acetazolamide, which works in the proximal tubule, and we're even using hypertonic saline and SGLT2 inhibitors for acute diuresis. And the concept about that, uh, to guide this third step, is really this idea of achieving sequential nephron blockade. And it's well known that sodium and water handling occurs all through the nephron. And so by just focusing on, on loop diuretics, which work in one segment of the nephron, we're interested in thinking about how we can affect naturesis and diuresis throughout this entire, um, entire nephron. So how have we done? So I've talked to you about the innovations that we've introduced in Seattle. How are, um, what are we doing with this service? So since we've launched, um, in about three years, we've seen 550 unique patients, these lots of rehospitalizations. Um, we, we are seeing about a quarter of all patients who are admitted to the hospital with heart failure, and we're seeing about 60% of all the ICU patients in the CTICU and the CCU. We, of course, have looked at our data in terms of our clinical outcomes since we've launched. So, Previously, I showed you the heart failure with AKI data compared to those without AKI, if you recall, with higher length of stay, higher rates of in-hospital death, um, and readmissions. So in the three years since we've launched, um, you know, and this is all descriptive data, no confidence intervals, so take it with a grain of salt. But uh, you know, in compare, looking at those patients who have heart failure or AKI, we've seen a reduction in length of stay of about 2.3 days. Um, a 2% reduction in death, a 5% reduction in 30-day readmissions, and a 4% reduction in need for acute dialysis. Is this chance? It could be. Um, but we did compare it to those heart failure patients without AKI as sort of a benchmark, and we found that um, length of stay in hospital death and 30-day readmissions has not changed in the three years for that group. So we're still doing a lot more data collection and in-depth analyses to confirm these data, but for us it was encouraging enough to continue the service. The other thing we're doing educationally is that we have lots of different learners on our service, which we love. So we um, started with the nephrology fellows, um, and then there was a request from the cardiology program director to have their fellows rotate with us now as well. So we have cardiology and nephrology fellows working side by side. We have internal medicine residents as well as medical students as well. And to support these learners, we've created um, an educational curriculum specific to cardionephrology. And then in terms of research, you know, I think you know, our goal for this was really to develop research questions that were guided by the questions we were seeing clinically um, and to help forge multidisciplinary investigative teams as well as recruit patients directly into research studies. And so in the three years, we actually have three NIH-funded studies now recruiting patients directly from the service into these studies. And so coming back to our patient, I would say, you know, hopefully we talk through these clinical conundrums that we're seeing frequently in the inpatient setting, but we, if this patient was in Seattle, they would definitely be seen by our, our service, and I would think consider new models of interdisciplinary care. So to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that heart failure and kidney diseases are highly prevalent and commonly coexist. Patients with um, concomitant heart failure and kidney disease have poor clinical outcomes. We still have so much to learn on how to best to diagnose and treat patients with heart failure and kidney disease, both in and out of the hospital. And I do think that research and innovative care models are the path forward to prove the outcomes for our patients. Um, I, I have the privilege of working with so many fabulous people, but I want to in particular thank um, my funding sources as well as the Division of Nephrology and the Kidney Research Institute where I'm based. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Nisha, thank you so much for that uh, really terrific presentation and innovative new service, and I'll just start before taking questions from the audience. Um, many of us on the renal consult service, when we get a cardio-renal consult, kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Your body language says yeah, it all. Just, just like, oh, you know, I hope this is not a negative, you know, interaction. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, if you're having cardiology fellows rotate with you, you've been able to change the dynamic. Can you speak to how this kidney heart service is more collaborative than kind of antagonistic? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I would say that's been a huge, it's been a huge culture change. All of a sudden they see 
um, the small group of attendings that are us, and they trust us. We've, built, we've proved to them that we care, we know what we're doing, and it's just built this, this structure of bi-directional learning, complete trust, and um, camaraderie. It's, it's fun. It's fun seeing patients together, we're collaborating, we're teaching each other, and I think that level of trust um, has made a huge difference, even with surgery. Um, in particular, I think that was always very difficult, cardiothoracic surgery um, interactions. And now, um, you know, the, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery calls me up all the time to run patient cases and get my opinion. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, great question. So, you know, frequently with um, initiation of SGLT2s and RAS inhibitors, we see this EGFR dip, I call it. I don't like calling it AKI because we see this temporary decline in EGFR, which actually in studies have sh has shown in the long term to be protective. But the initial response for, you know, a lot of clinicians is, oh my gosh, their kidney function is worse. Let's take them off the therapy that they desperately need. And we've shown that staying on these therapies benefits the heart as well as the kidneys. So, yes, so I think that this is an area of understanding. I think we've been too creatinine-centric as a field, and the kidney is a highly complex organ. Um, and, you know, summarizing all of kidney function with one biomarker is not the path forward. So I think we, you know, this, the studies that we have right now are observational, the, the one that we're doing this kidney biomarker work in, but I think there is a place for looking at maybe some post hoc analyses of the trials of looking at alternative measures of kidney function. Yeah. Andreas? And you showed in this one study that uh, the serum creatinine didn't really change with volume removal or uh, gaining volume and then removing it. Uh, in your patients, you're removing volume. Yeah. And why is it elevated? Yeah, good question. So, um, actually, in our diuretic protocol, we struggled about when, to, what would our creatinine threshold be. We came, um, as a group, we put our heads together. We said somewhere above 50% rise, which is much more uh, liberal than the current AKI definition. And it really, and it's not to stop it, but to think about what's causing the creatinine rise at that point. So if the creatinine rises out, you know, more than 50%, that's when we start thinking, well, let's assess their volume status better. So right heart caths, we're doing a lot of right heart caths and PA catheters to see really truly what their volume status is. Um, and then, you know, we're, we look for other causes of kidney injury that are not hemodynamic related. So that's when we look at the urine sediment and see if there's any other causes that could be explaining this. But I do, I think teasing out what are hemodynamic related injury versus intrinsic kidney injury is really tricky in these patients, and that's why we need better diagnostics. Okay, yeah, I'll let you. Yeah, great question. So the Sistan C, there's been very limited literature specifically in heart failure patients, so that's something we're looking at in our study. You know, it is a blood-based filtration marker as well. Um, you know, so there is concern that it, you know, there's a few things about Sistan C. It may not be as kidney-specific as we want it to be, um, and, it, you know, again, is it going to be as dynamic as something that is expressed in the urine? We don't know, but we will be measuring that as part of our study. Thank you. So there is a signaling pathway in the heart that's driven by the natural peptide receptors type A, which the natural peptide binds to. And we know that it has efficacy in heart failure because in Presto, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, so you know, the Entresto data is interesting. So there's been a few studies that have looked at kidney outcomes in those patients to see what it actually does with kidney disease. Um, potentially a positive signal, you know, I think that we don't have as much data as we want. And we're actually planning right now a biopsy study where we're gonna do, get heart and kidney biopsies concomitantly to help explore, explore some of those um, those specific pathways which may tie the two organs together. So I hadn't thought about the natriuretic peptide pathway specifically, so I, I really like that idea in terms of looking at more molecularly. Well, uh, there's still a bunch of data looking at the uh, SGLT inhibitors and the optic genetic effect uh, of the cerebral rate of reduction in heart failure. Yeah, I, I think we're trying to, uh, I mean, it's standard of care in my mind. And so you have to convince me why not to give an SGLT2 inhibitor at this point, right? I think um, in the acute setting, you know, we often hold off if we think they're not going to be eating or there's going to, you know, there's some um, concern about, you know, intake, you know, in the acute setting. But we're trying to get almost everybody on SGLT2 inhibitors in the hospital. And certainly in the clinic, I think it's become... Um, the barriers are decreasing. I think, uh, you know, what we're seeing, I think the biggest barrier is you start it and you have this EGFR dip, and that's when people get nervous and take people off of it. And so we're really trying to push people through not to take, to not, not only to start it, but not to stop it. So I think there's a few barriers in terms of implementation. But I agree with you. I think we should be giving SGLT2 inhibitors to all these patients. Thank you. And, you know, glad you for your innovation in getting the two groups to work together. <laughs> how, how do you transition, you know, your successes on the inpatient side to outpatient management for these patients as well? Yeah, great question. So actually, um, in July, we're launching an outpatient clinic that's going to be co-staffed by, it's a cardionephrology clinic, um, by, so a patient will come in. They'll be seen by a nephrologist and a cardiologist at the same time. And so, you know, we wanted to get this sort of under our belt first to see what the success was before launching the outpatient portion of it. Um, and that, that outpatient model is going to be very consultative. So the point is, not, you know, a lot of outpatient, um, you know, transitions of care from the inpatient setting to outpatient and then consultation. And then we hope to send people back to their referring nephrologist or cardiologist. But we're exploring this outpatient model this summer, so we'll see how it goes. Last question. So great talk. Uh, so I'm one of the advanced heart rate uh, attendings this year. I listen to this. And so um, I would also agree that probably when we consult nephrology, most of these cardiac patients can do it to figure out what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's always a bit of a, 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 an argument about what's really going on with volume and volume. So two sort of more practical questions for you. You mentioned a lot about the concerns regarding the use of GDMT. And so when somebody comes in with acute heart failure, what guidance do you give about whether you should stop things like Entresto or Sartan, agents that actually have beneficial hemodynamic and neurological yep. impact that might be better, even if their creatinine is a little bit up from their baseline? Then the other question, which is a little more challenging, is when do you consider ultrafiltration? This is another area we argue quite a bit about. When is not enough volume out causing further problems and yeah. Again, thanks. Great talk. Yeah. Love the idea of bringing us together. <laughs> we can all be friends. Um, so GDMT. So we don't stop RAS inhibition. I mean, uh, you know, or GDMT, because like you said, you know, there's activation of neurohormonal pathways. Why would I stop a therapy that is actually affecting that? And that's, you know, the activation of neurohormonal pathways are affecting both the kidney and the heart function. So we, our practice is not to stop them um, unless there is a good reason to. It's not a reflux, the creatinine's up and we stop them. And I think that's been a big change in management. You know, having groups of people that we all talk and standardize our care has been a, a huge um, advance, I think, in the care of these patients. You don't have the revolving door of attendings coming in. One person does one thing and another person does another. Um, and your second question is about ultrafiltration. So we actually, 
Ultrafiltration is like step eight on our diuretic protocol. So I firmly believe that if a patient can pee, we get them to pee and we don't ultrafiltrate. And so we are very, and, I, and actually with our service, we've seen a reduction in need for acute dialysis about 4% over those three years. And I think it's because we get involved earlier, we think about diuretic resistance differently, and we really try this sequential nephron blockade, and I think it's successful. If we can really focus on how best to diurese them, we can avoid ultrafiltration. It's truly the last resort. Um, I don't think it's good for the patient. I don't think it's good for anyone. And so, yeah, I mean, we do ultrafiltrate. There's times that you need it, but it, you know, we're, we're much more conservative about it. Thank you so much, Nisha, for a wonderful